Hi, so yeah, I'm Paul Verrill, Director of Anapsis. Um, just a kind of brief introduction to myself and Anapsis. So I'm an engineer by background, but a mechanical engineer, so it's kind of, I'm very pleased and thank you very much for electrical people to invite me on your, on your session. Um, so mechanical engineer by background, um, worked in kind of various industries and then joined Anapsis in 2010. Anapsis um, provides data-focused insights, so, you know, very passionate about the energy market. Um, these the, to the side is the kind of three things we do. The context for this presentation is that we provide data focused insight. So we have a large market data platform that's, that's um, pan-European and used by a lot of participants in the market. And we support that with consultancy services, reports and market support and access. So um, kind of moving on into, into introduction. So I'm going to be giving you my views um, to these questions that I kind of pause myself to answer. Um, we've got a we've got 25 minutes and it's a very, very big subject. So I'm gonna, gonna pick certain areas, there'll be certain um areas that you know we, we perhaps won't cover. And I think there is a QA at the end if anybody wants to kind of ask any specific questions. So these are the questions I kind of paused, and then I kind of promise I'll answer them at the end. Um, and from my point of view. And in the process, kind of give you some of the charts and the analysis. And um, these charts and analysis come from real market data or an Apsis forward analysis, drawing heavily on national grid ESO type um, scenarios and forecasts, uh, and overlaid with some of ours. And it's it's kind of GB focused, but it, it kind of is applicable to, to other kind of markets going through this same thing. So we're going to look at the energy crisis, what's made the crisis. Um, we're going to look at a winter 22 outlook. So we're kind of going to we're going to travel from now into the kind of future four or five years in the in the forward markets, and then even jump kind of 10 or 20 years. Then um, what is the context of net zero against the crisis? I wanted to link the two because there's lots of kind of discussion about is it the cause of it? Is it a contributor? Is it a savior? Um, and does the crisis make it harder or easier? Then kind of end talk a little bit about what does this all mean for people at the sharp end, so people like the people on this call and in the industry. So engineers and system designers trying to design and build transmission infrastructure and for companies trying to supply people's energy needs and make a profit because in our system, that's an objective. Um, so kind of this, this slide is kind of right, quite dense. The kind of key takeouts are in red. I'm going to, going to, going to talk you through. So the energy crisis, so this kind of primary thing that's driven the energy crisis is this unprecedented rise in commodity costs. Um, and this unprecedented rise comes on the back of incredibly low commodity costs, incredibly low energy costs, etc., which is a kind of, in a normal world, you kind of get these, and then laid over the top of it, we have some obviously extraordinary events. So first of all, starting in the top corner, we have gas. So you can see gas from 2021 into 2022, the current date. This was done in May, so slightly dated, but it, um, it still kind of holds. And then you can see up to 2025, and that's the forward market. So the forward market is, in theory, what you can buy now. So when we talk about price caps in the GB market or any kind of price mechanism in Europe, then and people talk about they have to hedge or lock in, which those, it's the right side of there, 22 to 25, that's the forward market where people are locking in at those prices. So you can see the market is expecting the prices to fall. It doesn't necessarily mean that's exactly where the, mic, where the price is expected to fall because in that curve, there is a risk premium. If I'm going to sell you power for 2025, there's a high risk, the price could be higher or equally could be lower. And that is all priced in. So people, um, supply companies now hedging in there. The other interesting thing you can see in this, in this, in this when we did, we did this particular chart, this kind of big price collapse. Now, this was a relatively um, local event, and it arose because we've got these, we, we've obviously got the war, we've got um, problems with gas supply, but UK has not really taken much Russian gas. I think we're less than, I think around about 5% or maybe a little bit more, but around about that region. And we switched to LNG imports. Um, 
there is actually not a massive amount of gas interconnection between our cells and a continent or island. So when the majority of gas we produce or bring in as LNG, we consume. And then with the crisis, we accelerated um, LNG imports. And then there was a problem in this particular day where the, inter where the gas interconnected was on maintenance or reduced output. So all of a sudden, you've got a lot of gas coming in and um, not many you know, so supply demand balance goes the other way, higher supply than demand. So that gas price collapses and then it causes our generation to be really cheap. And then our generation goes across the interconnectors in Europe. So in a way, exporting electricity for GB is a way of us exporting gas to Europe and helping in the energy crisis over there. But it shows the interconnection of the market. The bottom chart, the, the, the carbon chart, shows the also this growth, actually, before I move off the gas chart, the other interesting thing is in COVID, you could see that the gas price has been from 2018 to 2020, where it reached this low, gas price has been dropping. Consequent, and, and also oil price would have been dropping. That makes investment in oil and gas, apart from politically sensitive, also makes it harder to justify. So that investment slows down, and that's part of the input into the crisis. So coming back to the carbon side, it's the same chart. Um, the only difference is you can see the kind of word always has to appear when we talk about energy, the Brexit world. So when we went into Brexit, we created our own carbon market. And you can see that our carbon market has a higher price than European carbon market. So that has a local effect on power prices in GB. But the other thing you can see in 2020 is this big rise in carbon price. And this is by design. So the system would like the carbon price to rise to drive decarbonisation. On the left side, quite a, complete, quite a complicated gap, um, chart, but it's power price. It's, sorry, it's input costs. So we take the fuel cost going into a power station, divided by the efficiency, and the blue lines are CCGT 40% to 50%. The um, brown lines are coal 30%. Key takeaway from this is you can see in this kind of crisis period, lots of times where coal is, um, lots of times where coal merit price is below gas. So that means coal is cheaper to generate than gas. Why did all the UK power stations not switch on in coal? We, we kind of call them shy or reluctant market participants. Really, they're shy or reluctant market participants because they're closing. So they haven't bought any new coal for a long time. They've got a certain amount of coal stocks and they have capacity market contracts, which means they have to provide power and stress. So they kind of don't fully participate in the market, which again kind of feeds into um, elements of the crisis, driving prices because we're predominantly gas driven. Um, so that's kind of what's driven the price. So this is the input costs of prices. And I'm going to do a quick three slides um, a second. So we're just going to do a quick three slides that kind of look at winter 22. So what we're looking at here is a kind of densely coloured chart. And you don't have to worry too much about all the colours. I'll kind of talk you through roughly. But what we've got is August to April 23. The colour bars are um, generation from the fuel mix or available generation. So a generation that's available. The black lines are demand, so UK average demand, and then the higher one is demand if you add interconnector exports in or expected. This particular one is average wind output. So if we take, so, so building up the colors, the, the, the systems, the, the way we rank these is in, in order of kind of low variable cost on must run. So nuclear is must run, then we get wind, then we get biomass, then we go through hydro. That big blue section, that's gas. Um, then we're moving through the interconnectors into coal. I say coal shy, reluctant, kind of comes on last. Into that purple, we get pumped storage. So you don't really want to go into pump storage because pump storage is a strategic reserve or held like it, it well. It's not technically a strategic reserve, but we kind of use it to get out of trouble. So it, it's a um, because of its flexibility, we generally use it kind of last in stack. And then towards the end of that, you get some kind of more interconnectors. What this shows is this is there is a margin, but it's tight. We would normally want that black line to be well within the blue line, the CCGT, so we have spare CCGT capacity. 
This first slide is average. Average wind output. So taking an average case with base case average demand. So the margin is, avail margin is available, but tight. If we then start looking at a low wind day, you can see, so this is a kind of rocket forward. These are kind of roughly the same scale. So you can see how that loss of wind drops right down. So that the, the, sorry, the loss of wind brings that kind of tipping point where the black lines exceed the um, capacity um, a lot closer. This chart here, so this is on, you know, there's still, it's not throughout the whole of winter, it's certain days in winter. Um, and where low wind coincides with demand, interconnected pump storage are needed. That's a very unprecedented tight supply for us. If I kind of go ramp the, ramp the stress up a little bit further, and then we look at low wind, high demand, and then we look at another case where the French interconnectors are fully exporting. So why is that a potential? Well, the next slide will talk about that. So French interconnectors are fully exporting. Um, on these days, no generation margin on these days. So this is kind of pretty unprecedented. And a large extent why there's been a kind of call to arms for generation. We had the highest capacity mechanism auction. And I think we brought five or six gigawatts forward in this kind of winter. And the national grid and the um, government is, is calling for more generation in the winter following. So there is genuine kind of concern about that. Um, and it's not just about what happens in our country. So in this next slide, these, this is our, these are market prices for GB. So the purple line is GB and the blue line is France. So that shows you that this winter, France has a plus 150 pounds differential between GB and France. So if you're generating power in GB, don't sell it in the GB market, sell it in the French market, take it across the interconnect. Why is this big differential? It's because French nuclear projects have a problem. So like ours, they have an aging fleet. They've identified some corrosion problems, so they're expecting relatively low availability. And then that can cascade into the rest of the markets. The more interconnected you are, the more it cascades. So in a normal market, flow follows price until the spread closes. So GB power flows to France, GB price rises and France price falls, um, but there is friction at the borders, so you'll never get complete convergence because you have to pay to transport it across the interconnectors. Um, in terms of the interconnectors, this shows you a central case for interconnectors. It shows you where you are. So in the current crisis, it shows you where we are now, but it shows a central case of where we're planning to be. So you can see this massive increase in interconnector. So... Um, for kind of network engineers, HVDC seems to be where it's at um, for kind of lots of projects coming up. And um, so in the current crisis, we explain how interconnectors are way for us to export gas as power. So if gas is cheap in the UK and our power is cheap and we're exporting. The more interconnection we have, the more support we get from our neighbours and an outlet for excess if they are short. They pull power the other way. Um, sorry, we get from our neighbours and we get... If we have an excess of power, we can send it to them. They can pull power the other way, which basically means we share our problems, which can be good, but it means that we're not isolated anymore. We have to kind of look at everything together. Um, so I'm now kind of going to move into, so we talked about the kind of cause of the crisis. We're now going to look a, a lot further ahead at net zero. So the aspects of net zero. So we talked about margins being well, we talked about margins being tight. We talked about some margins being tight causes scarcity. High commodity prices causes high prices. Put them all together, add in some kind of French problems, we get high prices, giving us this crisis. On top of that, we have a kind of unprecedented war, um, which is putting very high risk premiums in the forward market. But now if we kind of look at from net zero, so net zero um, produces these kind of has these two problems, an excess problem and a stress problem. So the first slide, so National Grid has future energy scenarios. So this is FES 21. So this is an analysis chart, but using National Grid future energy capacity. So what they expect will be built in the future, the capacity that exists. 
um, with some kind of uh, anapsis adjustments and kind of splitting of fuel types um, into different different buckets for for our analysis. And then the red dotted line is demand. So you can see that the, um, the kind of basic nomenclature is the, the black and the gray is fossil fuel. And then the kind of green is wind. This orange at the top is solar. Then we get into interconnectors, pumped storage. This very fluorescent green is hydrogen green, so a new technology. And then we've kind of got storage at the bottom and nuclear. And you can see from 2022, we have this massive closure of nuclear plants, and then this kind of ramp up of nuclear plants. Bearing in mind that under this scenario, which is a net zero system transformation, and the nuclears get built more than we currently have, but you know, still relatively um, not a dominant portion of our generation mix. But you can see that if all of this capacity is fully generating, we have a massive excess of supply. If we then go to the other chart, so we have, sorry, we have potential very high excess flows and, and a storage is needed long and medium term in order for us to potentially balance that. If we go to the right-hand side, this is if I derate. So if I take all those fuel capacities and I derate de them in accordance with CM criteria and I plot peak demand and average demand. So what you can see is... By 2030, by 2035, based on this criteria, the kind of dispatchable power stations, which is fossil fuel, well, actually, by 2028, the dispatchable power stations, which is fossil fuel, um, biomass and nuclear, which is these grey, brown, yellow down the bottom here, you can see that we, in 2028, you can see that we're starting to use interconnectors and we're starting to use um, wind or relying on those for for for, um, for for security, and then as we progress forward, you can see. So this really is only possible with storage. So storage needed long and medium term. I put it on both sides because it is needed to manage the stress and the excess. What happens to the market in stress and excess? You go from very low prices, potentially negative, to very high prices. So very very high volatility, very difficult to manage. Um, the other point I kind of wanted to make, so just have to move something. So, if, if fossil fuel closes early before renewable <clears throat> ramp up, we get a bump in a roll. So, we've had a couple of these already in 2016. We had accelerated closure of coal, and the and the national grid, the government, and the and, and the bodies got together and basically, basically contradict. <coughs> excuse me contracted that coal to stay around. Um, and we have seen a bit of a, so we've constantly get this renewables being built and old plants being retired. If that mismatch, if kind of, if old plants retire quicker and then the renewables replace them or the storage replaces them, you get what I kind of call a bump in the road. And um, if this mismatch gets bigger, it becomes a pothole. And then it gets to, to, to really thrash the analogy, if it gets even bigger, still we get a sinkhole. You layer into that commodity prices or wars or gas, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so you can see that we have this kind of excess problem and this shortage problem. The excess problem, so for network, creates very interesting problems that national grid are, are kind of tackling. This is a na source national grid. I think it's a very good graphic for kind of showing this is showing where all the kind of wind is going to come in. So in the kind of eastern side and the western side, um, down to the kind of edge of North Wales. And the two arrows are showing where the power is going. You know, the kind of high demand centres, London, um, Birmingham, Manchester, et cetera, et cetera. So these high demand centres and then this renewable power coming in into these coastal regions. And the coastal regions along the east coast, well, so that we have a lot of power in Scotland. So I'm going to use a particular Scottish case because that's where we've had a lot of constraints. So the excess has to be stored, curtailed, or consumed. Um, and we also have to kind of manage, you know, we have to try and reduce curtailment. So the e, this chart with the green dashes on, this is National Grid's, NOAA's plans for new HVDC links 
taking power from Scotland into England. And on the right-hand side, this boundary capacity chart shows you where we are currently, well, actually 2022, and you can see this ramp up in border capacity. So it says B1, B2, B3, B4, B5, B6. The key thing that is B6 is the England-Scotland border. So B1 to B6 is various borders through the progression of North Scotland right through to the UK-England border. What does that mean for in kind of markets? So I put a chart, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of dated analysis chart down the bottom. What it shows is the B6 limit is the red line. So that's the England-Scotland border limit. And that is the installed capacity of wind in those areas. And it's color-coded based on the subsidy regime. Why is that important? Because the cost of curtailment depends on me replacing lost revenue. So the higher subsidies a plant gets, the more I have to pay to curtail them. So you can use a chart like this to have a look at what the costs of curtailment are. But what you can see is on a very high wind day, on a very high wind day, you're going to get curtailment or you need to store it or you need to consume more. So despite planned investment, there is still an excess on high wind. So I, I stress these are anapsis forecasts. Um, National Grid have their own forecasts. But I think they, the criteria for designing this increased infrastructure is not to completely prevent curtailment, because that could potentially be uneconomic. And also storage is a part of it. So I'm kind of coming to the end and I'm kind of now going to answer my questions. So bear in mind, it's kind of my opinion based on the analysis and the data. Um, I think Anapsis can have a kind of unique view in the world. It's, it's focused on the, on the data and the markets we see and the behavior and being around a long time. So if you kind of want to follow our Twitter stream, you'll see kind of some of the kind of streams of this consciousness in there. Things can be quite interesting. So energy crisis, what defines it as a crisis? It's really been this unprecedented commodity costs. And um, what was the beginning of this? This was driven by a, a reduced investment in oil and gas source renewal. So we're not investing so much in fields, new fields, etc. cetera. And um, once we get the demand slump of COVID-19 and record low gas and oil prices, I think oil price actually technically went negative at one point. Then we get this again, how are you going to get a project funded or built? Add to that sensitivities of investors not really wanting to kind of invest in um, high carbon solutions. Then you get this kind of investment problem. Um, this then gets transformed into high prices that we get a ramp up demand post COVID lockdowns. And that's what we first seen with these massive. So we have industry gets going and um, oil and gas can't cope with this kind of, so we start to get a supply demand imbalance. Then we get the Ukrainian war. So Ukrainian war, as we kind of, we see on the news, flows haven't massively been disrupted from the Ukrainian war. But what has been disrupted is sentiment and risk. And the statements that we're good, you know, that Europe is going to move from Russian oil and gas, Russian oil and gas might switch it off, et cetera. So we start to see this very high premium go into the market. We also see this kind of strange effect of a two-tier pricing in that lots of countries and companies won't buy Russian oil and some companies and countries will. So you end up with two markets. You've got a non-Russian market and a Russian market. So all driving uncertainty. So future, this starts to become really my kind of view. There is a period when the war ends and, and sanctions reduce and roll back. We're seeing accelerated investment in oil and gas and LNG infrastructure moving away from Russia. That Russia oil and gas will still exist. So potentially, whenever we see these types of events, we can see an overcorrection and very low prices. And um, moving on to the winter 22 outlook, um, it's tight. <laughs> Hold on to your hats. Um, early plant closures with energy commodity price crisis, nuclear issues in France, and interconnection. That's kind of leading to probably one of the tightest winters we've seen since I've been in Anapsis. Um, market price drives flows, so our neighbours' problems are ours, and ours are theirs if the market works. Um, electricity export is a way to export gas, so gas, gas issues in the EU can make winter worse for GB. Um, Moving on to the what is the context of net zero against the crisis? Is it a cause of it? No, in my view, 
No, it isn't. Is it a contributor? It has required, it has driven a required switch from fossil fuels and hence reduced investment. So it has contributed to what we're seeing now. Bumps in the road are expected where closure of the old world assets occurs quicker than the new world assets are built. And the bumps are multiplied by these other exceptional factors. Um, the new world solution to intermittency on the scale required, storage, has not been solved yet. We are still exploring the solution. We're in very early days of it, but if you look at the charts and the analysis, we need it to be quicker. Storage is quite a strategic asset, which means that the market by itself doesn't deliver it, and the market keeps telling everybody that. Um, is it a saviour? Not in the near term. But there is accelerated solar build on the continent, which is helping to remove reliance on Russian gas. So in the, in the, in the near term, no. Um, but obviously, the more renewables we have, the, the kind of less reliance we have on fossil fuels. Does the crisis make it harder or easier? I do think it makes it harder because we kind of lots of, look at lots of discussions on this subject. And, you know, people who are, you know, are worried about the pace of decarbonisation or the costs or the impact, kind of use it as a measure, use it as a, as um, this energy crisis, use it as evidence that we should invest in more in oil and gas, not turn away from it, keep those plants on longer, reverse the closure of coal, et cetera, et cetera. So those discussions have kind of gained momentum against the decarbonisation. So I do think it, these crises do make it harder. What does this all mean for people at the sharp end? I think we have to do a lot of forecasting and scenarios. We have to accelerate the changes to the network to allow to live the net zero with assets and technologies to avoid the side effects. So the side effects of decarbonisation, and I know that kind of National Grid and, and all the different TSOs and Scottish, T, Scottish system operators and the European system operators are working on that. Things like reactive power, inertia, short circuit current level, etc. For companies trying to supply people with energy needs, make a profit, hedging, buying forward is expensive. You are paying for a risk premium as well as required fuel, but it's something you have to do. You can see moving more to vertical integration, asset-backed supply, plus incentivizing customers to profile load and install their own kit. Kind of companies like Octopus leading on this. And that obviously knocks into the network. You know, you're going to have to have a lot stronger distribution systems. So that kind of brings me to the end of my slides, I am going to stop sharing and then I will hand over to the Perfect. Jordan to Thank you, customers. Paul. Thank you. Um I does anyone in the audience have any questions? Um I know we we are um, sort of short on time for Q&A. Um, I didn't want to interrupt. Um, that I was actually really interested in everything uh, you had to say. The, the, the one question I have is, what do you think of the UK's energy security strategy in dealing um, with, with this crisis? Because everything seems to be long-term solutions, such as new nuclear power stations, and, and there aren't any real short-term solutions uh, and also what role does energy efficiency have to play in in helping this scenario i think on the on the first one i think they, they have we have the a capacity mechanism in the uk market and we have it across europe and lots of other countries and the capacity mechanism was was a, a form of availability payment um, that would be paid to generators to effectively keep them around during the transition it, it recovered this kind of lost money. The design of that mechanism, you could arguably say, it, um, has kind of failed to cover these, the type of crisis we see. And the reality is that we're talking about security and supply issues this winter. We're talking about um, you know, a margin crunch. And the capacity mechanism was, was designed, was meant to get away from that. Where's the failings in it been? Uh, you can see we're constantly trying to redesign that system but, but one of the failings really was an aspect of the kind of auctions and how much was procured. That drove the price very low. And there's actually some very big GB power generation units that are offline or mothballed at the moment because the market in the COVID years was so difficult, they didn't make it through. And the capacity mechanism were actually stopping them coming back on because there's rules if you renege on a contract, you can't get your contract back. So, yeah, th there's design issues in that bridging bridging design. Um, on 
Sorry, what was the second one, Jordan? Sorry. It was what does energy efficiency have to play in in this role of uh, basically reducing demand in electricity? I mean, I think that I mean it's it's interesting, isn't it, that the um, you know kind of leading into this kind of crisis, we had the extinction rebellion and the insulate homes and things like that. I mean, it, it does. I live out in the countryside in a very, very inefficient oil-fired house that was kind of a barn and it kind of leaks heat like crazy. When you start looking at these prices, that becomes very important. So you can see that investment in not just energy efficiency, but kind of that insulation and design of heating and systems like that. You can see that we'd be a lot happier if we'd done that five or six years ago. 100 um, percent i'm sorry that is all t- uh, the time we have uh for now I, i'm just really wary of uh the time but i really do appreciate that that was um a very interesting uh presentation and we really appreciate you spending the time with us okay thank you very much Hope thank you, you paul the rest of the day thank you thank you Bye.